Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, a Pittsburgh Steelers podcast made by fans like you, for fans like you. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. I am your host, Joe Kuzma, and this is a special edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. One to come to you one day earlier before training camp kicks off. Players are reporting, and we're all psyched up for some actual football. We get to see players on the field. We have some real news to report coming up soon. But today's episode, we're actually going to cover what the crystal ball may have in store for us during training camp in regard to players contracts and even into the future. And of course we heard all of this news, the tweets coming out actually quite frustrating since I was already on the horn with my guest, Nick Signorelli, who is a former Steelers beat writer from bleacher reports. And we were talking later in this episode about the Antonio Brown contract, whether or whether or not that will occur this season, it'll be an interesting interesting discussion but before then for those of you who are psyched up for this preseason I encourage you to go to steelcityunderground.com slash preseason and download SCU's free 2016 preseason welcome guide it is 20 some pages of bios and information on all the new players coming to the Pittsburgh Steelers whether that's free agent Ladarius Green one of the most prized tight ends in free agency this season or maybe first-round draft pick Artie Burns, who is going to potentially battle for the starting cornerback position here in the 2016 regular season coming up. And we're going to get to see a lot of Artie in training camp and, of course, the preseason game. So you can get that free download at SteelCityUnderground.com slash preseason. And, of course, if you have a question for myself, Nick, or any of the other guests here on the Steel City Underground podcast, feel free to call our hotline at Nine. Feel free to call our hotline at 203-904-SCU. At this time, I'd like to welcome my guest. He is a former Steelers beat writer for Bleacher Reports and also a founder of Steelers Nation South, which is a community and a group of members who have a very vibrant Facebook group and also a Facebook page planning some big things there in Southern Florida when the Steelers visit the Miami Dolphins later this year. Nick, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And as I was saying off the air, this is pretty much your baby today because you are, I want to call you my stats guy. You've got all the numbers. (laughs) And you laugh, you laugh, but I'm sitting here and I, as I've mentioned on previous shows, I'm not always an expert at everything. And if I don't know something, I'm going to find out about it, but I did one better. I brought the guy that is the source. This guy, Nick Signorelli, he knows everything about the Steelers salary cap. We're going to beat this thing to death in this show. It's going to be fun. This is a good lead into training camp because This is where the deals are going to happen. Traditionally, the Pittsburgh Steelers do not discuss contracts once the regular season starts. These deals happen, and as soon as these guys start reporting, we could have contract signings as soon as day one, but we'll more than likely be seeing them as they go through August. Some of the big names on the docket that will be free agents next year, of course, David DeCastro and the ever-maligned Le'Veon Bell. Nick, you were with me and joined uh, joined me on the previous show talking about that whole mess, but we're going to try and ignore as much of that as possible because I'm going to sound like a broken record, and I don't know, to some people, records are out of style, so... Who's the first big name that you think the Steelers, uh, I don't know, who's the big name they have to get the deal done with or who's the first guy that you think is the priority uh, heading into training camp and getting some deals done? Well, the priority needs to be David DeCastro. I mean, Marquise Pouncey is fantastic on the line. Yeah, he's one of the best, but the reality is he gets hurt, and when your center gets hurt, you have to have – the person next to him that is going to be able to pick up the slack. I mean, Cody Wallace was a great replacement, but he's nowhere near what Marquise Pouncey was. And having someone like DeCastro right next to him just changes the entire complexity of the line. 
Okay, and DeCastro is also under his fifth-year option, which means, number one, he's very young. He's still – he's getting his first big contract, and he is a cornerstone to the line. He is this generation's Alan Fanica. He has that kind of talent and that kind of ability, and you really – that's not the kind of person that you want to let go. So playing under the fifth-year option means to extend him now – you have the advantage of the signing bonus and bringing down the first year number. If he were to sign a $30 million contract, which is probably in the ballpark, maybe a little bit north of that of what he's going to sign. Then the way that you can break it down with the low first year, you can trim five, $6 million off of cap space that we're using right now. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, I totally agree with your assessment, uh, especially mentioning Cody Wallace and Marquise Pouncey. Polar opposites. Marquise Pouncey, according to Pro Football Focus, I think I saw his when he played a la- his last full season in 2014, was one of the top five rated uh, players at his position, uh, uh, maybe offensive lineman altogether, if I recall the statistic. You know, they're always throwing numbers, figures, and percentages and ratings around. Right. But uh, on the other end, Cody Wallace was in the bottom five. So if that tells you just the job that Mike Munchak has done and the talent that surrounded Cody Wallace, David DeCastro being one of those, yes, absolutely. This is one of those guys that has to be – uh, this is a, a must-do deal, and behind them there isn't like a whole plethora of talent, really. There is just Cody Wallace. Uh, you may have Chris Hubbard, but I think he's going to be really fighting for a roster position himself with the Steelers having three potential uh, – well, they have a three-man battle basically at the left tackle position, although I don't think Gerald Hawkins has – he's a very much a long shot to play at that position this year, but Big Al Alejandro Villanueva, who, who's started 10 games last year uh, in the absence of Kelvin Beecham and then of course the newly signed Ryan Harris who started all of the games for the Denver Broncos Uh, he was effective he wasn't necessarily great but he was also a swing tackle that could play both sides as can Hawkins Uh, Hawkins is a guy they're probably going to protect on the 53 man roster these are inexpensive players but David DeCastro they have to find the money they have to get it done with the exception of that outlier year when he was drafted originally in 2012 of course the Steelers in their front office didn't even think maybe that he would follow the pick 24 this was a guy that had uh, top 10 pick potential and he falls to them at 24 he gets hurt in that first season he only starts three games he appears in four of them but since then he has played in 15 games in the 2013 season and then every game in 2014 and the 2015 season. Consistent, reliable. Like you said, this is the the, the this era of the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's their version of Alan Fanica. Now, of course, Alan Fanica helping coach the line. He's going to be there at training camp as well. I think part of that is I think the Steelers have this maybe perception that Mike Munchak could get plucked from their roster in the near future. So they're kind of grooming maybe a potential replacement there, just like when they had Joey Porter hanging around knowing that Keith Butler would eventually get the call up the defensive coordinator. So speaking of that, we're probably looking at maybe a, a defensive player as the next priority to get a deal done, or do you have somebody different in mind? Oh, no, Timmons is next. Timmons is without question next. Timmons needs to be next because his cap number is so large. And also the fact that he's entering his last season. Yes, he's 30 years old, but he was also one of the top-rated inside linebackers in the game last year. He is always at the ball. He has been in Mike Tomlin's system since Mike Tomlin has been the coach. He is a cornerstone, but – the Steelers have kind of shifted some of his responsibilities over to Ryan Shazier. Ryan Shazier is now calling the plays, which has been Timmons' job since Farrier. So that means that they are most likely looking at a shorter-term contract. I think it's probably going to be maybe a two, three, possibly I think four years might be pushing it a little bit, but signing him to a new deal. He has a $15 million cap charge, but of that – $9 $9 million of it is his salary this year. So just like I was saying with DeCastro, it's the same situation. When you have a player that's in the last year of his contract, if they give him a $4 million contract with a signing bonus for the $9 million, then that's spread out over the course of the year. So he's probably going to be getting a contract with a $13, $14 million signing bonus over four years, and then that's 
it'll drop his cap number five million dollars a year. Now, uh, explain to some of the listeners that it's probably all of these figures uh, just are going over their head. Why is it important that some of this money be spread around in such the way it is? Of course, some of that is kind of a spoiler for the the rest of this show because there are some other names we're going to be mentioning that the Steelers have to be able to afford. But why is it so important that some of this money gets spread around with David DeCastro and Lawrence Timmons? Well, because the key is to bring their salary down, their cap number for this year down as far as you can, because we're going to have a Le'Veon Bell and an Antonio Brown that we're going to have to sign next year. We have to clear up as much cap space as we can right now. And even if we don't redo the Bell deal yet or the Brown deal yet, if we hold that money throughout the season into next year, we can carry it over and then use that because teams are allowed to take anything that they haven't spent under the cap and allocate it to next year. So if we can cut down David DeCastro's salary by $5 million and we can cut down Lawrence Simmons contract by $5 million, that's $10 million in cap space we have right now. Even if that's not used right now, we can carry that over to next year and use that for next year's play. Yes, and of course, there's also a floor. Uh, everybody's aware of the cap, and there is an actual ceiling of how much the Steelers can spend. But there are other NFL teams that just can't be, you know, cheap skates and very and just tightwads with their money. They also have a floor of how much they must spend. So that's why you see some of these like ridiculous contracts that get handed out for certain players, like. Well, look at Brock Osweiler, for example. Uh, the teams have to spend that money, and they're going to try and allocate it as best as possible. The Steelers have a number of free agents that are going to be, uh, well, to be if the deals aren't done this preseason. As we know, very, very seldom does the team ever do a deal in the regular season. I think Troy Polamalu was one of those few examples. No, of- Troy Polamalu actually signed the day before his first con- the day before the first game. Ah, they were okay. going to Baltimore and he signed it on the plane on the way there. Okay, well I stand corrected then. But <laughs> I, I remember it was close. Was there anybody actually I thought Troy was one, but maybe it was was Heath Miller by any chance or no? Do you happen to recall no, that? No, I I think you have to go back to like Jason Gilden days in order to find it because I actually think it was Jason Gilden was the last one that we signed after the season started. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you know what? Now that you mention that about Polamalu, that does come to memory like right right before the season. It was like big news. It's like the day before. It's like the night before Christmas, and it was like, oh, Troy Polamalu just mm-hmm. signed an extension. So I do kind of remember that in a way. Uh, just jumping back to Lawrence Timmons real quick. Yes, the original, the first ever draft pick of the Mike Tomlin era. So I yeah, I do expect he, he hasn't been slowing down. He's 30 years of age. Uh, still some tread left on the tires. Uh, I do think that a deal gets done with him. I think it's going to be a team-friendly deal, and it's also going to be fair to him. And uh, just real quick, I'm going to go through a few of these. We've already said David Castro, and we could jump back to any of these names, but I almost want to do like a, a lightning round real quick of these 2017 uh, okay. th- the names. And, I, and I'm looking at a list of all the contracts, so they're not necessarily alphabetical order, but I'm going to shoot a name. You say yes or no if you think a deal gets done this training camp preseason before the regular season starts, or maybe maybe we wait. So, uh, okay. first name out the gate off the, uh, the hot seat here, Jarvis Jones. No. I agree. They didn't pick up his option. He has to prove what he can do this year. Yeah, I totally agree. He was going to get paid what, like? Eight eight and a half million dollars if it was a fifth year option if I if I read that correctly. Yeah, it was somewhere in that neighborhood. And his production just hasn't been up to that. I I think if they do a deal with him, uh, it he'll be more affordable if he's the same Jarvis Jones that he has been and he could still be with this team. That's not to say that they won't sign him later on. But then again, he has a, if he goes out and has this monster year, I'm not really sure what they do with some of these other names that are on the list here too. Uh, for example, Le'Veon Bell is another name. Prior to this whole drug suspension thing, I would have said he absolutely would have been signed before week one. He would have been a priority, and I'm guessing they probably would have paid him on average 9 to $10 million a year. Now it all depends on how this suspension plays out. If it's re- if he's not suspended, 
then they will most likely have a deal done with him by the time the season starts. If he is suspended, they're probably going to wait until next year and use the franchise tag if they have to. Yeah, and just to remind some of the listeners, if you happen to miss the previous episode of the Steel City Underground podcast, Nick actually popped in with a little bit of information that was very relevant as to one of the reasons that Le'Veon Bell could get off the hook here. There's also a whole lot of conspiracy theories that I threw out there. So uh, once again, not to be a broken record, uh, we'll just leave that on the table as is. But Le'Veon Bell wrapping about $15 million a year. I think that was really blown out of proportion. I don't think that the Steelers were prepared to pay him anywhere near that amount of money. The highest paid player at the running back position currently is Adrian Peterson with around $12 million a year. I think it was just one of these things where guys want to – Hey, they want to sound like they're these superstars, you know. They want the, they got the bling bling in their ears and whatnot. Fifteen million a year, like I said before, what's he supposed to do? He, he may have been better off, Nick, if he just went into country music and he actually sang about <laughs> his dog running away and his pickup truck being broken and and not having any money and his and his woman leaving him and everything else, as opposed to the rap life of hey, you know, I got all these girls on my arm and he's making it rain. You know what I mean? Uh, so I don't know that he's necessarily. Yeah, but- <laughs> if you think about this though he's made four million dollars over the last four years between four and five million dollars over the last four years he can say he wants 15 million dollars but if you've made four million dollars in four years and they're offering you a nine million dollar year contract that's really hard to say no to i totally agree and i think right after adrian peterson the next highest paid running backs will sean mccoy at about eight and since we tend to right. Every contract outdoes the next one. I don't think you're going to outdo Adrian Peterson. I don't think anyone puts that amount of dollar value on the running backs these days. Uh, that really is an – he's an exceptional player, and he is an exception uh, when it comes to that contract. Uh, another running back – Well, the Steelers, the Steelers are never going to pay – what any other team in the league would pay because the Steelers contracts are normally written different than a lot of other teams. A lot of teams will backload a contract, meaning putting way more money at the end of the contract than they do in the beginning. And the Steelers are much more evened out over the course of it so that when it gets to the end, they're not stuck with either having to release the player or like the Ravens did with Joe Flacco, have to pay him a ridiculous amount of money in order to keep him on the team. The Steelers have always been that way. We're, we were that way with Ben. We were that way with Ward. We were that way with Paul Amalu. That's why so many Steelers play into the last year of their contract. And that's also why the Steelers don't redo a contract until the last year because of the money that's paid over the course of them. It's more balanced out. Yeah, and that's that's part of uh, that's the whole philosophy, and it's been that it's just the consistency. I mean, you have a team that's Mike Tomlin's entering his tenth year as the head coach, and they've also had uh, Kevin Colbert's been there for geez uh, since the two thousands or maybe even before that. So. Uh, another running back I was going to mention, the reason you don't want to give all this money to Le'Veon Bell is you're probably, you might have a little bit more money tied up in securing D'Angelo Williams. What do you think? No, I don't think so. I think they let him play out this year, and then we will give him a team-friendly deal, probably another two-year deal at the end of this season. But there's not going to be a whole lot of demand for a 34-year-old running back, regardless of how he does this year. Even if Le'Veon Bell is suspended, even if Williams starts 10 games, and even if Williams gets 1,200 yards, he's 34 years old, no one is going to pay him a ridiculous amount of money. As you said, the running back position is devalued. There is no sense in paying a backup running back, which he's going to be no matter where he goes, more than a couple of million dollars a year because you can get them late in the draft with way less wear and tear on them that are able to produce the same kind of numbers. And teams just aren't going to go crazy over D'Angelo Williams, no matter how good he does. And he is going to play his last down in the NFL with the Steelers. It's probably going to be another two-year deal when this one's up, and then that'll be it for him. Yeah, and not to 
kind of contradict what I had said previously with one of my callers on a show earlier in the week. They had asked me what D'Angelo Williams' status would be in light of the whole Le'Veon Bell situation. I do think, just as you think, that D'Angelo Williams will be a stealer, but I don't think it's a priority here in the preseason or prior to the regular season. And the Steelers, I think, can afford to hold out and wait maybe before the free agency period begins for the next league year in the case of D'Angelo Williams. Uh, There's... The next name on the on the list, we could just do a simple yes or no on Cody Wallace. I think he's kind of a dime a dozen guy that they could easily replace. Yeah, he's not before you know. <laughs> yeah, we just got done. Uh, we got done not singing his praises. <laughs> uh, hey, right. I still love. I still love <laughs> you, Cody. Good backup. <laughs> he's a good backup, but you don't pay backups until their contracts up. That goes. Yeah, um, Marcus Wheaton. No, he will not be a Steeler next year. He's in his last year in black and gold. I can almost guarantee it. Yeah, I just can't see it either. The same thing like uh, you had Mike Wallace leave. Actually, speaking of the Ravens and Joe Flacco, and you're talking about the how the money isn't spread out, it's like if Mike Wallace is a Raven next year, they're going to pay him a ridiculous amount of money. And most people don't realize that the guaranteed money, what was – still owed from the Miami Dolphins to Mike Wallace that was paid in 2015 is basically the difference. If you go in the 2017 and compare Mike Wallace's contract with Antonio Brown, about $8 million, all that money that was owed from the Dolphins when they sent him packing to the Minnesota Vikings. So it's kind of very interesting that uh, beyond 2016, if Mike Wallace doesn't play out his 2017 year, I'm still, I'm still kind of curious if he, he may be in competition. If it wasn't for the guaranteed money, I'd say he may be in danger of not even making the Baltimore Ravens team this year. But they're hurting so much at wide receiver and for what they're paying him. I don't I don't know that's going to happen. I actually related him to being the Darius Hayward Bay of the Baltimore Ravens wide receiver core. Of course, I'd rather right. have Hayward Bay because he's cheaper. He also plays special teams. So if Mike, And he can catch. He, he, now he can because he has a good quarterback throwing to him. A lot of people are still, you know, they're ragging on DHB, who do you have throwing to him? Jason Camel? I mean, come on now. Right. I mean, it's just, it's just. I mean, he may even had Jamarcus Russell. I don't know. Jamarcus Russell may have been a little bit earlier than that. But the Raiders' quarterbacks were terrible when he was playing there. So yeah, Mike Wallace. If he well, doesn't play in 2017, Antonio Brown's going to end up making more money. Even though a lot of people are saying, "Pay the man." And we're going to get into Antonio Brown soon after we knock a few more of these out. So. Well, one real quick thing on DHB. Um, he was drafted, I believe, seventh overall by the Raiders when he was actually projected to be a second-round pick. So he was taken way too high for his talent. He was never a first-round wide receiver, and he never would have been unless he had a career with a quarterback like Ben, who has done it with Wallace, who did it with Antonio Holmes. He did it with, with – um, Sanders and he's doing it with Wheaton now. I mean, he did not have the talent to make the quarterback look elite. So he needed an elite quarterback to make him look like a number one pick. So is he a number one pick? No, he should have never been drafted in the first round, but the talent that he has is more than adequate for the position that he has with the Steelers. Yeah, and even for as long as he's been around, uh, he came into the league in 2009, as you as you said correctly, seventh overall pick by the Oakland Raiders, former product of Maryland, but he's only 29 years of age, so he had a birthday in February. So he's still, the three-year contract they gave him was actually a very good deal, I think, for this team uh, when we're talking about Darius Hayward Bay. Uh, we've got uh, another guy expiring next year. I, I don't know, he's... He, you know, James Harrison had to make a decision on whether to come back this year. And he's already, there's word that he's thinking about maybe even contemplating p- playing another year beyond this at 39 years old. I think that would be incredible to see, but I just, I don't know. I don't see it happening. This team uh, is very fortunate that James is even playing for the amount of money he's playing for now. Well, the thing about James Harrison, the beginning of his career did not start off with him playing. He bounced from the Ravens practice squad to the Steelers practice squad, back to the Ravens practice squad. They sent him to NFL Europe. He wasn't playing in the NFL 
for, until he was, I think it was 27, 28 years old. So he got a much later start than most do. So he has a lot less wear and tear on him. Yes, he's getting old. Will he play another year? That really all depends on Jarvis Jones and Arthur Motes because I think with Bud Dupree, they are set. I think he is going to be the full-time starter on the one side. It, it's due. He needs to. He needs to step up and take that responsibility. But it's going to, James Harrison staying is going to come down to the ability of Arthur Motes and Jarvis Jones. If Jarvis Jones has a monster year, then there's no reason to keep James Harrison next year. He's a great teacher, but then, you know, ease him into coaching like they did with Joey Porter. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, And, of course, yeah, Harrison, kind of an ageless wonder, maybe not the same wear and tear, but I know even being a bit younger than Harrison and not being a freak athlete, I still get everything that pops and cracks in the morning myself. So I I just think he's an amazing story. And I want to say that as another one of those pro football focus statistics I saw floating around where he was like the best valued contract in the NFL, I think last year, maybe at his position or as a defender based on what he did. And that was even just in kind of a part-time role until we really got into the playoffs. He saw his reps increase. I mean, it, it seemed like he was just like, coach put me out there and he was getting business done. The next, <laughs> if you're in the playoffs and James Harrison is able to play, you put him on the field. The guy's a monster. And then next year would be no different if his skill level is the same as it was last year. Absolutely. If he wants to keep playing, if nothing else as a linebacker to give the people a break. Yeah, and, you know, I'm going to get into – now we're going to start getting into – we're scraping maybe a little bit of the bottom of the barrel. No offense to any of these guys, but we're starting to look at people who, oh, maybe aren't as much role players and whatnot. First name, Shamarco Thomas. Gone. Yep, agree. Nothing more needs to – You don't take a player in the second round if you plan on keeping the guy that's already on the roster. Sean Davis is going to take his place. He's done. He's in his last year. Landry Jones. <laughs> you know what i don't know he is one truly that i because we don't really get to see what he can do i mean he did a little bit less than average last year replacing ben is that really is going to depend on how the steelers handle ben Roethlisberger, how much more time that he is going to play if at some point i know people don't want to talk about this but over the next couple of years We're going to have to draft his eventual replacement. And if the Steelers take an early pick on a quarterback, first, second, third round even, then there's no room on the roster for Landry Jones. He he just has to go. But if they're not going to take one, then he's somebody that they need to keep. So I think what they need to do before making a decision on Landry Jones is see how Ben's feeling through this year towards the end of the year. But he's not going to be one that's signed before the – before. No, he's he's not a priority, and actually both of the backup quarterbacks vying for that number two position are are due for a contract or are due to be free agents at this point of the conversation with Bruce Gradkowski also up in 2017. Personally, I'm glad you answered the Landry Jones question the way you did because I wanted to say – you. I was waiting for you to say yes or no, and I was going to say maybe, and you kind of answered everything that I was going to say. <laughs> And, of course, you and I have had these conversations offline, and in a future episode we're going to be talking about life after Ben, of course. And Landry Jones, hey, a lot. Of, I've been a defender of Landry Jones. I mean, uh, I put out some of his statistics that I had, and just based against even Michael Vick, a lot of people what they don't realize is a lot of NFL teams don't even have a number one quarterback they don't even have a right. QB1. And then you go to QB2, who was Bruce Gradkowski last year. And, of course, I think the Steelers had in mind maybe some quarterbacks that they were looking at maybe in the draft. And those guys didn't fall to them. So what ended up happening was they – right after the draft, what was it, Monday, they signed Bruce Gradkowski. So it was kind of like one of those, hey, we kind of have him sitting on the side waiting. And he's only signed for one year, and I think Bruce is is going to be let go. He's going to be the casualty there if they end up bringing in anybody that's a quarterback. If Landry Jones proves he could be a capable quarterback to a backup, he, he can be, I believe. But, again, they brought in Vic last year, and he was technically the third one. Landry Jones comes in, and just to compare – I have some numbers here in front of me, Nick. Believe it or not, I said I didn't have any show notes, but I do have some show notes. <laughs> I up. 
So just just for the people who are going to say, Joe, you are crazy. Uh, I, you keep defending this Landry Jones. He's a bum. I've heard it all. I really have heard it all with Landry Jones. What do you expect from the fourth guy off the bench? He usually comes in in these games last year in the third quarter and in the fourth quarter. But taking a look at it, Antonio Brown, okay, Michael Vick as the quarterback, 19 targets, 9 receptions for 85 yards, no scores, no TDs, four, four first downs, only 9 catches for 19. Now, with Landry Jones in there, Antonio Brown catches 12 passes, so three more passes on two less attempts with 17 targets, 232 yards to Vick's 85, and, of course, no touchdowns there, but twice as many first downs. So that tells you that Landry Jones has a rapport with the players that are there. I think he's finally getting it. The light bulb has gone off. Now, Martavis Bryant's not there this year, but with Michael Vick to Martavis Bryant, the numbers were actually far more worse. There was actually a down where Michael Vick threw a pass. Martavis Bryant probably shouldn't even caught the ball. It was for, like, negative yards. So when you see this, it was three targets with two catches for eight yards and no touchdowns, no first downs. Now, this is skewed a little bit. Part of that is – well, it's also skewed a little bit because Landry Jones was able to have the entire playbook because he had been with the team for years. Mike Vick had a very, very limited playbook. I think they said it was 25% of the whole playbook. Now, when a quarterback only has that percentage of the playbook, it's really easy to take an Antonio Brown out of the game or a Martavis Bryant out of the game. It's easy when you don't have very many options on the plays to call to shut down the weapons because you don't you run the same plays much more often and they're tipped off in defensive coordinators today, 25% of the playbook doesn't work for anybody. And that's the problem that we had with Mike Vick. If Bruce Gradkowski or Landry Jones gets hurt again, bringing Mike Vick back would be a good move because now he knows the playbook. Now you're not handing a playbook off to somebody that is just joining the team that doesn't know it. If anything happens to Ben and Gradkowski can't do it, and Landry Jones can't do it. Mike Vick at least knows more of the playbook now that he can actually be more of a weapon as opposed to what he was with us last year. Absolutely. There's a lot of truth to that. The first piece of that is the defensive coordinators. I mean, these guys have instant photographs as soon as the players are coming off the field. They're handing them printouts of – you could see it on both sides of the ball, and they're studying everything. So they they pretty much know your whole script – like, especially if it's only 25% of the playbook. I mean, your, your whole script's gone by halftime maybe there. And you saw what happened when they tried to ad-lib in overtime against the Ravens. That didn't work so successfully either. But they did ad-lib against the Chargers. Uh, ben, I guess, drew up like that little sandlot play, or so the legend goes. And that worked that out. That was Vic. Yeah. Yeah. That was Vic. It was. And he's not incapable. We saw in the preseason he threw that bomb to Martavis Bryant. So, But at this time, once again, an aging quarterback, a lot of people don't even realize that Vic isn't even on the roster right now. And then they're, they're calling the cut Landry Jones. And here's the other half of that, by the way, with Landry Jones to Bryant, 8 of 16. And I was saying that, yeah, also skewed because there was that big uh, – the the big play where Bryant caught it and then had all those yards after the catch for the touchdown. I think that was in right. the Arizona game. But 8 of 16, 179 yes. yards, three touchdowns, seven first downs. So Landry Jones, if, if you have somebody that's capable of being in there and running this offense, Landry Jones isn't necessarily an awful option maybe to have as a backup. You could do far worse, and there are teams that, trust me, you and I both know, far worse options as their starting quarterbacks as it is. So Cleveland? Uh, yeah, constantly. Every <laughs> Constantly. They'll go through three quarterbacks again this year. I've already predicted that. Yeah, they will. Uh, Yeah, so Landry Jones, Bruce Gradkowski, those guys covered uh, just a few more of the role players here. Uh, I think really the only names that that need to be suggested here, Vince Williams, linebacker. I don't know. Not before the season. I don't think so either. I think this is one of these guys that can that can get done, and even after free agency starts, and that may be not a giant demand for him. Uh, this is funny going down this list because Ross Ventrone, I don't think – I don't even know that he makes the team. <laughs> so he's always no. cut and re-signed. Um, I don't and wanna... one more thing about Williams. It depends on Timmons' contract. Yes, if they're not going to bring Timmons back, then Williams becomes much more of a priority because we let Sean Spence go. 
even though he's going to be a free agent, we could get him back if we wanted to. Yeah, he's on the one-year deal. It was a weird swap. It was almost like they traded Steven Johnson and Sean Spence with the one-year deals <laughs> there as as your kind of backup linebacker and special teams ace. So uh, Greg Warren, the long snapper, 34 years old right now, 11 years in the league, one of the last guys that has a Super Bowl ring on this team. I'm real curious here if he plays another season. If he plays, we'll, he'll stay with us. He's been with us for a long time, and you also got to realize that's a position that doesn't take a lot of hits and it doesn't take a lot of abuse. And the way that they're protected now, you know, you can't line up somebody right on top of them. You can't go over them. The rules to protect the long snapper are unbelievable. So a 35, 36-year-old guy being able to do it, yeah, absolutely. If he wants to come back, he will most likely be back because he does a great job. Yeah, I feel the same way. And then, of course, the last two names, we got Big Al Alejandro Villanueva. And I'm not sure what his contract status is. I'm not sure if you have the details there as to whether or not. Would he be a restricted free agent heading into into next year? I am almost positive he is a restricted free agent heading into next year. Yeah, so there's absolutely no need to do an immediate deal. And then, of course, kicker Chris Boswell of is – in the same type of category and of course i think he will be the longtime kicker as long as he stays healthy he he did a tremendous job last season so the the final wrap up here is the one that we're always i think talking about unless you had something additional to add there nick well when it comes to boswell what i would say is yes next year they can give him the exclusive rights tag however I think if he has a year this season like he did last year, they're going to lock him up long term. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And uh, like I was saying, the the one that we're covering all the guys that are expiring for and possibly, possibly or potentially becoming free agents for 2017, of course, that's going to all change once camp opens up. Who are some of the guys, maybe, is there anyone on this list that's not in a, a pending or going to be a free agent after this season that the Steelers may look to lock up? Because we've already talked about one, for example, in Antonio Brown. A lot of people are saying, pay the man. What what, what do we think? Do we have anybody, be, well, first of all, A.B., but do we have anybody outside of A.B.? No. Because you basically named everybody whose contracts would be expiring that would qualify for a deal. The Steelers have a blueprint that has been in effect since Chuck Knoll. You don't sign a player until he has one year left on his contract unless it's the quarterback. That's how they've always operated. That's how they're always going to operate. That's just how it is. And to all the people out there that think that we should just pay the man, you got to ask this question. Is Antonio Brown a future Hall of Famer? And if he were to retire today, the answer would be no, he's not. Well, we had future Hall of Famers in Troy Palomalo that we didn't do it for. We have a Hall of Famer Jerome Bettis that we do it for. We had a Hall of Famer Rod Woodson that we didn't do it for. It's how we operate. You don't go against something that works, and the way the Steelers do it has been proven time and again to work. I love Antonio Brown. I don't want him going anywhere. I want him to be re-signed, but he does not get his contract until this season ends, and that's when he's going to get paid. Yeah, and then the uh, the other names, of course, that still have a couple years left on the contract, looking ahead to 2018 besides A.B., that is a no for Ryan Shazier, of course. It just way too far ahead for some of these guys. We have Arthur Motes locked up for two seasons as well as Stefan Tu. We can't re-sign Shazier yet. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're we absolutely can't, We can't re-sign Shazier until the season's over because – He's still playing on his rookie contract, and they have to complete their third year before you can give him a new deal. So we couldn't give Shazier a contract now if we wanted to. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, of course, heading into next offseason, since he was a first-round draft pick, and I was just reading this off the list, and as you know, I'm running on very little sleep here. So, uh, (laughs) yeah, but you're right about the Shazier thing. But, of course, then they have the option of doing the fifth-year option on his Correct. rookie deal, which Ryan Shazier may be, may be worth uh, doing that for. But then again, we're looking into a crystal ball that's like way we're, – we're kicking a can way down the road on this. Antonio Brown is really the only big name that ever comes up because everyone feels, hey, he wants paid. But he's not rapping about $15 million a year either, so – 
Well, and you also got to think when Antonio Brown signed his contract, he wasn't anywhere near the player that signed it. He signed a five year, $42 million contract. I think it is right around $42 million. He wasn't a five year, $42 million receiver. When we gave him that contract, we, he outplayed his contract, but that shouldn't be negative on the Steelers. When he signed that contract, it was a fantastic contract for him at the time. And a lot of people thought the Steelers were crazy for giving him that kind of money. Granted at that time, they didn't know he was going to become one of the best receivers in the NFL. So, I mean, hindsight yeah he's outplayed his contract but at the same time like when they gave him that contract that was the contract they offered mike wallace that he didn't accept so they gave antonio brown number one receiver money at the time and sorry that other lesser receivers have made more money but that doesn't change the fact that it's still a good contract yeah and just being a bystander of all this nonsense that was going on in seattle over the last few seasons with guys that decided they wanted to Oh, with two years left on their deal, like um, um, the names escaping me. Cam Chancellor is one of them last year, and Marshawn Lynch and these guys demanding to get paid. Uh, just thought it was just absolute lunacy. Hey, you know what? You guys knew what you were getting into when you signed on the dotted line. Just be a man right. and live up to your contract. And I, I think some of the stuff, of course, always talking about some of the reports that come out here and, and some of the – just some of the things that are non-reputable, and one of them being the whole Antonio Brown type deal that happened last off season. And it was because he showed up in like a Rolls Royce that was like black and gold or whatever. And it's like, come on, man, the guy's flashy. He dances, he does a forward flip into the end zone. Okay, so <laughs> it tells you everything you need to know about Antonio Brown. But uh, again, I agree, and I've told this story many times before. I actually was a Big, big fan of Antonio Brown's. Um, I remember I'm one of these nuts that actually goes and attends the preseason games if I can make it out since some of them are on weeknights. And I remember watching him play in those games. I think he actually got penalized in the one for, like, jumping in the end zone and kind of sticking to uh, the the greats or whatever, the the poles like uh, Spider-Man, almost like the end zone thing that he did or attempted to do last season. And the guy just, like, there's just something electric about him that you saw. So. So when I knew they gave him the long-term deal, that was the first jersey I went to go out and buy, and that was the first year of the Bumblebee jerseys. And I, w- I was telling – actually, I was telling your buddy Matt, who is another founder of Steelers Nation South, uh, he was asking about autographs. And I said, I'm not a big autograph seeker, but if I ever get anything signed, it's going to be that jersey because it meant an awful lot to me that – that I was kind of right about Antonio Brown. I took the side of, hey, you know what? I saw Mike Wallace was turning into this kind of prima donna, and you see Antonio Brown was putting in the work. And I, I never in a million years am I going to say I thought he was going to be this guy that's on all these covers uh, this year for fantasy football, and people are actually picking a wide receiver to be number one in fantasy football, and can he break all these records? They're making up records for Antonio Brown so they could put his name next to it. Never in a million years that I think that was possible, but I was a big supporter of his right out the gate they had these new bumblebee jerseys and i said that's the guy i want because i already had ben i already had ward at that time i had like kiesel and miller and all the big names troy i I have a bunch of jerseys in the closet obviously so i i needed somebody new uh with the new style jersey and i said i want to get antonio brown you know how hard it was to find that jersey and uh, sorry sure sorry if the listeners heard this a few times but i can't expound it enough i think my my wife actually had to find one down in the strip district for my birthday uh and believe it or not they play i think they played on my birthday that year when they first wore those jerseys which made it even more cool so but yeah it was unheard of now you can't go anywhere and not see an antonio brown jersey i remember i was probably the only guy wearing an antonio brown jersey Kind of like there's one person I saw wear a Sean Sweesham jersey one time, and somebody had a Charlie Batch that floats around every now and then. So, hey, Nick, it was great having you on the show again today. Do you want to tell any of these listeners how they can maybe follow you on social media and uh, maybe uh, I could link back to you as well? I'm not on any social media. I'm just in the groups. <laughs> okay, so basically <laughs> – Basically, hey, you know what, and, and that's and you know that's totally fine. I, I was telling everybody uh, just previously that you know I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on Snapchat, I'm stretched thin as it is. I mean, I do Facebook and I do the Twitter thing, and if you go on Facebook, I do uh, have like a 
something somewhere on the column on the page and this is going to depend too if you're using it on a mobile app or anything like that on your phone because facebook changes things like i change my underwear but there is somewhere on there that's liked by page and steel city underground likes steelers nation south or you could do a simple search for the group uh we have to screen for spammers and stuff like that in there of course you get the the fake accounts and everything like that but just go in type your name in the box or or request an invite and we'll add you to that group it's ever growing and like i said they're planning a big event for the away game in miami later this year so nick thank you for joining me once again and ladies and gentlemen This will wrap up this show. I hope this brings some clarity to some of the various salaries, contracts, all the numbers, and just playing shell game with the money because the Pittsburgh Steelers have a system and process that's in place. And as Nick and I have discussed, they're probably not going to break that mold for any, any potential reason. They're probably the only player that ever done it for would have been Big Ben Roethlisberger. And, of course, they already have that deal secured for the future. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, be safe, be good, and I will catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 